In 1878, a 65 year old woman took her own life when she was haunted by the thought of being sentenced to life in prison. The local papers at the time dubbed her New York's wickedest woman, and many despised her for the fortune she'd acquired on the back of her illegal activities. But what were these activities, and how did she end up in prison? To answer this, we need to go back to 19th century England. Anne Trow was born on the 6th of May 1812 in the town of Painswick in Gloucestershire, in southwestern England. Her father John Trow was a labourer, and the family were not affluent. As a result, Anne began working when she was barely a teenager, as a maid in a butcher's household. This was an all too common fact of life in 19th century Britain, where children were sent to work in factories and other establishments from as young as nine years of age. Anne also wed when she was young. At 16 years of age, she married Henry Somers, a tailor from Wiltshire. Yet before long, she realised that he was an alcoholic, and by that time, Anne was already pregnant with their first child, a girl who was born in 1830 and whom they named Caroline. By that time, their economic prospects were already dwindling in England, and in 1831, the young family set sail for the Americas, one of tens of millions of Europeans who did so during the 19th century. While on the ship, the family would have been anxious about this new land, and hoped to improve their lives, and perhaps even make a small fortune. But one thing that didn't exist across the pond were titles. But with today's sponsor established titles, you too can become a lord or lady just like me. Established Titles is a project based on a historic Scottish custom, where landowners are referred to as lairds, or lords and ladies in English. So by buying as little as one square foot of dedicated land, you too can officially change your name to lord or lady. This even comes with a unique plot number, so you know its exact location. Something that I love about Established Titles, apart from the fact that it's a fun and great last minute gift, is that you're supporting global reforestation efforts. They plant a tree with every order and work with global charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot and we can even build our little forgotten life's kingdom. Thanks again to Established Titles for sponsoring this video. Go to establishedtitles.com forward slash forgotten lives to shop their early Black Friday sale, plus get an additional 10% off any purchase with cold forgotten lives and help support the channel. Anne's fortunes did not improve upon arrival in the United States. She and Henry settled on William Street in Lower Manhattan in New York City. But shortly afterwards in 1833, Henry died of typhoid fever. Thus the young widow Somers found herself far from home, scrambling to make ends meet in New York City to support herself and her infant daughter. We would probably have never heard of Anne Troll and her alter ego Madame Restel had it not been for her second marriage. This occurred in 1836 when Anne wed Charles Lowman, a 27-year-old well-educated printer who worked for the New York Herald. He had immigrated to America himself and was of German and Russian background. It was from her second husband that Anne began developing an interest in contraception and population control. Charles was a member of a circle of radical thinkers and philosophers in New York at the time, and one of their subjects of concern was the rapid expansion of the population of the United States and many European nations since the early 18th century. As a result of this interest, he had ended up publishing a number of papers on population issues in the 1830s. Anne soon began to develop an interest in contraception herself. She was encouraged in this by Charles, and additional know-how was provided by her brother Joseph, who had also immigrated to America and who was now working in a New York pharmacy. Soon, she had developed a contraceptive pill, one which included a mixture of ingredients such as Penny Royal, Black Draft, Savin, Ergot of Rye, Mallow and Motherwort. These she ground up and made into pills and powders. Armed with these products, 
she and Charles concocted an elaborate backstory for her business, claiming that Anne had a grandmother in France, a Mrs. Restel, who had shown her the recipe for these contraceptive pills while she was visiting Europe training as a midwife. Thus, in the late 1830s, Anne began selling her female monthly pills under the name Madame Restel. At this time in the United States, abortion and contraception were both legal in almost every jurisdiction. Consequently, Anne was free to advertise her contraceptive or abortion pills legally in the New York papers. Her first notice, for instance, ran in the New York Sun in March 1839 and effectively informed women that if they had an unwanted pregnancy, she could offer a certain remedy to those who called to her office. This was on Greenwich Street, and it was here that many New York women began calling from 1839 onwards to obtain some of Madame Restel's female monthly pills and preventive powder, as they were soon being described as. Alternatively, individuals from out of town wrote to her, and the certain remedy was sent to them in the mail. Anne's early forays into contraceptive and abortion pills and powders relied on folk remedies and ingredients of dubious effectiveness. However, she soon expanded her services into contraceptive and abortive methods of a more precise nature. By 1840, Madame Restel was operating a boarding house and referring to herself as a female physician. Here, some women gave birth to unwanted children whom Anne used her connections to find good adoptive homes for. But it was also clear that abortions, both by taking abortifacients and through surgical methods, were occurring here. This was not a violation of New York state law at the time, so long as the abortion was carried out before quickening, the point at which the pregnant woman could begin to feel the fetus move around, and after which, it was deemed that the child constituted life. This usually occurs around 16 to 20 weeks into the pregnancy, or roughly 4 to 5 months in. Thus, Anne was only risking legal difficulty if abortion services were offered to women who had passed this point in their pregnancy. As early as 1840, Anne was in some legal difficulty, owing to the death of a woman called Maria Purdy, shortly after having an abortion performed at Madame Restel's boarding home. Purdy had confessed to having had the abortion to her husband on her deathbed, and he subsequently contacted the authorities. The press erupted with anger against Restel, calling her the monster in human shape, and accused her of carrying out acts against God. Legal charges were then brought against Anne, but she successfully defended herself in court. The following year, Mary Rogers, a noted beauty who worked in a New York tobacco store, was found dead in the Hudson River. One eyewitness swore that she was dumped after a failed abortion attempt, and this was quickly linked to Madame Restel. But nothing more came of this. Afterwards, rather than being dissuaded from her activities, Anne actually expanded her abortive and contraceptive work, opening offices in Philadelphia and Boston. The case of Madame Restel and the death of Maria Purdy had gained some notoriety in the New York papers in the early 1840s, and this combined with a growing movement against abortion saw a tightening of the laws in the years that followed. By 1845, abortion was largely prohibited in New York State. Moreover, the punishments for performing an abortion were increased considerably. Now, if an abortion was performed after the quickening, it was deemed to constitute second-degree manslaughter, and so, could result in several years in prison. Anne's services increasingly moved underground in the mid-1840s as a result of these changes to New York state law, but she nevertheless continued her work as before. It should be noted here that Madame Restel was not entirely motivated by an ideological desire to allow women to have control over their own reproductive capacity in the same way which many advocates of abortion rights in the US and the world are today. That was surely a factor in her work, but she was also highly motivated by money, and there is evidence to suggest on more than one occasion that she was willing to assist in an abortion which she had at first refused to facilitate when she was offered a much higher sum of money. 
This was exactly the scenario which led to her arrest and first imprisonment. In 1847, New York was captivated by the story of the arrest of Madame Restelle once again. She had apparently facilitated an abortion for Maria Baldin. Baldin had become pregnant by her employer, a man who had offered to pay Restelle an unusually large sum of money to have the pregnancy terminated after she at first refused. Evidently, the abortion was then carried out, but when Baldine subsequently fell ill, she pressed charges. Restel argued at trial that Baldine's illness was the result of her suffering from syphilis, rather than anything she had done. But the court and public opinion were firmly set against the woman who first started advertising her female monthly pills eight years earlier. She was found guilty and was sentenced to one year at Blackwell's Island Prison on what is now Roosevelt's Island in the East River. A 19th century prison was not a pleasant thing, and one would think that the experience of dwelling in one for a year would have dissuaded Madame Restel from continuing her abortive work in the aftermath of it, but this was not the case. Although she claimed that she would forgo any further surgical abortions, she continued to sell her pills and powders and commenced work again at her boarding house. Evidently, New York society and the government authorities fell for this ruse. In 1854, she applied for naturalized citizenship status, which she received, while around the same time, the mayor of New York City, Jacob A. Westervelt, attended and officiated at her daughter Caroline's wedding. Behind the public facade though, Restow and her husband continued to offer illegal abortion services. As these were now prohibited in an increasing number of states, customers travelled far and wide to obtain an abortion at the famed Madame Restel's offices. They paid handsomely too, with between $50 and $100 being a standard fee and upwards of $1,000 being charged for higher-end clients who wanted greater privacy. Yet, by the end of the 1850s, the trickery was up. The newspapers dubbed Madame Restel the wickedest woman in New York, and detailed the enormous wealth she and her husband had amassed as a result of their activities. For her part, Anne was content to fire back at these attacks on her through an ostentatious display of her affluence, appearing in public in the finest furs and wearing diamond jewellery. When travelling around the city, she used her own private carriage drawn by four horses and with her own liveried coachman. Most strikingly, she and Charles had a huge mansion built as their private home on the corner of 5th Avenue and 52nd Street. Over these years in the 1850s and 1860s, she earned hundreds of thousands of dollars, the equivalent of tens of millions of dollars in today's money when adjusted for inflation. Despite her flaunting of the law, Madame Rester was able to avoid any further legal jeopardy for many years to come. The outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861 saw the abortion issue in the lobby surrounding it shelved for many years, and so Anne was able to go about her business largely unhindered. Yet, in the early 1870s, Madame Restell met her match in the shape of Anthony Comstock, an anti-vice activist who in 1873 set up the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. Comstock campaigned against everything from abortion and prostitution to erotic material and gambling, and was determined to bring about the demise of Madame Restell. The same year that he established the Society for the Suppression of Vice, he also successfully petitioned to the US Congress to pass a series of laws criminalizing the sending of obscene, lewd or lascivious, immoral or indecent publications through the mail. This included things like contraceptives and abortifacients. The Act for the Suppression of Trade in and Circulation of Obscene Literature and Articles of Immoral Use quickly became known as the Comstock Laws, and it was this legislation which would bring about Madame Restell's fall. The Comstock Laws carried serious penalties, even providing information to another person about where they could find abortive or contraceptive services could result in a fine of up to $2,000 and a 5 year jail term. Thus, Anne had to be more careful in her business dealings 
from 1873 onwards, but duplicity led to her downfall by none other than the architect of the new laws. On a spring day in 1878, Anthony Comstock showed up at the door of Madame Restel's office, claiming to be a married man who needed some contraceptive pills for his wife. After she had assisted him, Comstock took the pills directly to a police station. The following day, police showed up and searched the premises, finding instruments which could plausibly have been used to carry out abortions. Thus, Madame Restel was arrested, charged, and then bailed. In the days that followed, articles began appearing in New York papers by Madame Restel and others, arguing various sides of the case. It seemed as though it would make for an explosive trial, on the morality or immorality of what Anne had been doing for decades in New York, but the trial never came. At 65 years of age, and facing the prospect of spending much of the remainder of her life in prison, the woman who had become the most famed abortionist in New York City over a period of four decades took her own life on the 1st of April, 1878. Her maid found her in her bathtub, having cut her own throat. 144 years later, the abortion issue is as decisive in the United States as it was in Madame Restel's day. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Madame Restel, I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you thought of a like down in the comments and if you have any other suggestions, also leave them in the comments. I hope you are subscribed and the notifications turned on to get all my videos as soon as I upload them. And if you want to check out any of the items I use to make my videos or any cool historical items and books, be sure to check out my Amazon store, which can be found in the description. That is all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.